Hello, welcome to Lockdown Anatomy. I am Professor Alice Roberts, I'm a professor at the University of Birmingham, and I've designed these anatomy videos with medical students in mind, but I hope that they're useful and interesting to lots more people, whether you're learning anatomy, brushing up your anatomy, or just curious about the amazing structure of the human body. In the first anatomy tutorial, I looked at the bones of the upper limb, that's, that's really the arm in lay terms, now, the upper limb includes the pectoral girdle, the clavicle and the scapula, and then all the bones down the arm, all the way down to the fingertips. In this tutorial, I'm going to start focusing on the joints and the muscles, and we're going to look at the joints and muscles around this area, around the pectoral girdle and the shoulder joint. Once again, I'm using 3D4 Medical's Complete Anatomy app to show you all of this anatomy. And we will get into looking at those joints and muscles, but to begin with, we're going to strip it right back to the bones. So there are the bones of the upper limb, and we're going to focus in on that pectoral girdle, the clavicle, and the scapula, and the joints that attach the clavicle to the rib cage, to the axial skeleton. At the medial end of the clavicle, it attaches to the sternum at the sternoclavicular joint. And then I can add on some of the soft tissues, so the capsule of the shoulder joint, the ligaments around there, and also the ligaments around the sternoclavicular joint as well. And then we'll just rotate around to look at the other end of the clavicle, which articulates with the acromion of the scapula at the acromioclavicular joint. Underneath that, you can see a broad, flat ligament that's called the coracoacromial ligament, because it attaches from the coracoid process of the scapula across and back to the acromion. And then underneath the clavicle, between the clavicle and the coracoid process is the coracoclavicular ligament. So that's a really important stabiliser of the acromioclavicular joint more laterally. Now we'll take those away and focus on the shoulder joint itself. That's the joint between the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula. There's the capsule of the shoulder joint. And if we move around, we can see an interesting structure which is disappearing up inside the shoulder joint itself. This structure is a tendon, and that is the tendon of the long head of biceps brachii. You probably know it as biceps, but there's one in the leg as well, so we have to call it the biceps of the arm, the biceps brachii. That's held in place by a transverse humeral ligament which bridges across between the lesser tubercle or lesser tuberosity and the greater tubercle or greater tuberosity of the humerus. And that helps to keep the tendon of the long head of biceps in place. In fact, that transverse humeral ligament is really just an extension of the fibres of the shoulder capsule. Now I'm going to start stripping away some of those ligamentous structures and we'll get back down to the bone again because I want to show you the trajectory of that long head of biceps. It's a tendon which actually runs through the shoulder capsule itself. So it goes inside the shoulder capsule, it runs through that synovial cavity, it's quite unusual. And it attaches, as you can see, just above the glenoid fossa of the scapula to the supraglenoid tubercle, which is actually quite faint. It's not much of a bump at all. So there it is, the long head of biceps brachii. Now I've taken away the humerus so we can have a better look at the socket, the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity of the scapula. And you can see that it's quite small. It's only about a quarter of the surface area of the head of the humerus, and it's very shallow as well. It's slightly deepened by a rim of fibrocartilage around the outside that I'm just drawing in here. So that forms a, a kind of ramp or a lip around the edge of the glenoid cavity, and that's called the glenoid labrum. That's what the shoulder capsule actually attaches to. That glenoid labrum is made of fibrocartilage then, a type of cartilage with lots of collagen fibres in it, even more than hyaline cartilage, which is the sort of cartilage that lines the glenoid fossa itself, a, a glassy looking cartilage, the same cartilage that lines most synovial joints, in fact. 
Now I've added back in the ligaments and we'll start to add in some muscles as well. And we can see the deepest muscles around the shoulder in this view, the short scapula or rotator cuff muscles will be coming back to them. But let's add on some more superficial muscles and see what those do. The muscles that we can see here are the most superficial ones, the ones that we can see once we've done a dissection and taken away skin and fascia. There's pectoralis major, the large chest muscle, deltoid, a triangular muscle, over the shoulder joint and up in the neck platysma a very thin broad sheet of muscle we'll see what that does in just a second down in the arm we've got biceps brachii we're getting very familiar with that now how about a bit of living anatomy platysma is not the most attractive muscle it's one of the muscles of facial expression uh, that is descended down into the neck and it does give you a very odd expression when you activate it so here is my platysma see all these fibres standing up in my neck. You can try it too. Well that's quite enough from platysma I think so we'll get rid of that so we can see some of the underlying muscles in the neck and focus for a minute on that large chest muscle again, pectoralis major, attaching from the sternum and the clavicle across to the upper part of the humerus. So you can see what it does if you raise your arm out to the side, pectoralis major pulls your arm back down by the side of your body, it adducts your arm. If we take away pectoralis major, you can see a much smaller muscle underneath it. That's called pectoralis minor. And that is attaching from the coracoid process of the scapula down to the ribs. So it's actually attaching to the third, fourth, and just out of view, the fifth rib down there. Now we can't see its upper attachment terribly well because it's covered up by deltoid muscle. So I can highlight that, then remove it. And now we can see that tendon of pectoralis minor high up in the shoulder and attaching to the coracoid process. And here's our old friend, the long head of biceps again, that tendon going right up into the shoulder capsule. And here's the short head of biceps brachii, the other of the two heads of that biceps muscle attaching to the coracoid process. And we can also see there above the clavicle, trapezius muscle. Well, now I'm going to take away the short head of biceps. I'll illuminate it then whisk it away. We can see something else underneath it. There's another muscle there attaching from the coracoid process, as you can see, down to the medial side of the humerus. So this is called coracobrachialis. It means it stretches from the coracoid to the arm. It's a small muscle and we'll meet it again when we look at the muscles of the arm in more detail, but it's just worth noting here. And while we're looking at small muscles, let's have a look at one that is tiny and tucked up underneath the clavicle. Can you see it there? Stretching down from the undersurface, the inferior surface of the clavicle, down to the first rib, or at least to the costal cartilage of the first rib just there. I'm just going to add some lines where it's attaching there and up to the clavicle so you can make it out more clearly. Now let's look at trapezius again, so we'll need to zoom out a bit. You can see trapezius in the front of the neck there, but you really see it in all its glory when you rotate around to the back. And now you can see the hugely extensive attachments that this muscle has. I'm going to outline it so that we can really appreciate how large it is. So in blue, I'm just showing you the attachments of the left trapezius muscle. And you can see that it's a very apt name for a muscle which is essentially trapezoid in shape. And then with its partner on the other side, it creates this lovely diamond shape, stretching from the skull at the top out to the shoulders on either side and then down to the bottom of the thoracic spine. I'm just going to label up the attachments of trapezius muscle. It attaches up there at the superior nuchal line on the back of the skull and then down the ligamentum nuchae which stretches down the back of the cervical spine and then to all of the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae. 
and then the fibres, as you can see, sweep sideways, sweep laterally to attach into the scapula, onto the spine and the acromion of the scapula. Now, if you were to activate all of trapezius together, that's going to pull your scapula, your shoulder blades together at the back. But you can also use the upper part to move the scapula up, the lower part to pull it down, and it can help to rotate the scapula on the rib cage as well. Moving on, and it's time to look at another really large muscle. This one a little lower down. I'm going to have to take away triceps to get a better look at it. So we're looking at this muscle which has a lower attachment than trapezius to the spine, and then turns into quite a narrow tendon stretching across to insert into the humerus. I'm outlining the shape of this muscle now in turquoise. So this is a very broad muscle. You can see the upper part of it lies under the lower part of trapezius. And this muscle is called latissimus dorsi. Wonderful name, it means the broadest muscle of the back and it really, really is. So it has this extensive area of attachment from the spinous processes of the lower thoracic vertebrae and the thoracolumbar fascia below and then its tendon rushes up and laterally getting narrower and narrower and it ends up inserting into the front of the humerus so I'm going to have to get rid of some muscles to show you. I'll get rid of pectoralis major, I'll get rid of biceps, let's also make coracobrachialis disappear and deltoid as well. So we just dissect that away and now we're getting a much clearer view. Around the back, let's get rid of triceps as well. And now we can see latissimus dorsi much better. We can see those fibers converging, running forward, spiraling round and inserting into the front of the humerus. The insertion goes a little bit further than it looks here, so I'm just going to draw that in. It inserts into the floor of the bicepital sulcus, and it's a very characteristic tendon when you see it in dissection. When you look high up in the armpit or axilla, and you see this white, shining tendon of latissimus dorsi. Just behind that tendon is the more fleshy tendon of teres major. So that's a muscle which is coming from the scapula across to insert on that upper end of the humerus. While we're here, I just want you to notice this other muscle that attaches from the scapula to the ribs called serratus anterior. But now we're going to get rid of some of the large muscles that we've already seen. We're going to get rid of trapezius. We're going to get rid of latissimus dorsi, even though it is a very beautiful muscle. And now what can we see? Well, another set of muscles that are named after their shape. These muscles which attach from the spinous processes of the vertebrae across to that medial border of the scapula are called the rhomboids, and they are rhomboid in shape. Next up is a muscle attaching to the superior angle of the scapula, and this muscle streams down from the neck. It has its origin on the neck vertebrae and this is called levator scapulae. It does what it says on the tin. It lifts the scapula. Squaring up a bit, we've got this lovely view of the back of the scapula, a posterior view, and we can see teres major again. Remember, we saw that from the front in the anterior view. In case you've forgotten, let's swing round and have a look. If we move round and look at the front, there is the tendon of teres major inserting into the medial lip of the bicepital sulcus. Now we'll say goodbye to teres major and goodbye to pec minor and we'll take away the clavicle as well for good measure and subclavius now that it's hanging in the air with nothing to attach to and we're left with a really good view now of the muscles that are most closely associated with the scapula. I can highlight serratus anterior and make all the other muscles disappear so I'm left looking at the attachments of this one particular muscle, the digitations which give it its name, inserting into the ribs. And you can see its origin is from underneath the scapula from the medial border of that bone. Now let's highlight another muscle. This one is subscapularis. It comes from under the scapula, from the subscapular fossa, and inserts onto the lesser tubercle 
of the humerus. Next up is supraspinatus muscle. So we can highlight that and we can see that it's attaching to the greater tubercle or tuberosity of the humerus. And then if we spin round, we can see where it comes from on the scapula from above the spine in the supraspinous fossa, giving it its name, supraspinatus. It runs over the top of the shoulder capsule and this is what it does. So complete anatomy can show us the action of a muscle it moves the arm up and out to the side, that's called abduction. Now let's move down to infraspinatus, coming from the infraspinous fossa on the posterior surface of the scapula. This muscle is going to pull on the side of the humerus, so it's going to turn the humerus outwards, it's going to laterally or externally rotate it. Slightly tricky to see because it's underneath deltoid here, but you can see that backwards twist of the humerus, that lateral twist going on there it is. Now we'll move from infraspinatus down to teres minor. So this is attaching to the lowest facet on the back of the greater tubercle or tuberosity of the humerus. So these short scapular muscles all converge on the neck of the humerus inserting into the tuberosities forming a sort of continuous cuff around the humerus. They're also called the rotator cuff muscles. They are subscapularis on the lesser tuberosity, supraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor on the greater tuberosity. You might have heard of them because they sometimes cause problems, rotator cuff disease, especially supraspinatus where it passes underneath the acromion and can be subject to impingement. Thinking about those rotator cuff muscles and how they operate the shoulder joint, it's useful to think about those movements on yourself, I think, and try them out. So if you stand up and then bend your elbow, so I've got a 90 degree bend at my elbow there, and then just stand here with my palm facing upwards, facing you, my humerus is in a neutral position at the moment, but I can bring my hand across my body like that. So that is medial rotation of the humerus. So that action there is being carried out by subscapularis. So I activate subscapularis, and it pulls that lesser tubercle of the humerus and medially rotates the bone. I can move my palm out the other way, so that's lateral rotation. So that's the movement that supraspinatus and teres minor are creating. Those two muscles are activated and they're pulling on the back of the greater tubercle or greater tuberosity and laterally rotating. Supraspinatus coming right over the top of the shoulder joint initiates abduction, just gets it going before deltoid can take over with the whole movement. Now I mentioned that supraspinatus tendon can get impinged, squashed underneath the acromion. There are lots of other structures squished into that gap between the head of the humerus and the acromion as well. So let's look at what passes through that subacromial space. The long head of biceps, the shoulder capsules there as well, supraspinatus tendon of course and a little pocket of synovial fluid the subacromial bursa so you can get bursitis too. Right now we need to do dissection in reverse and add the muscles back in because there's one very important shoulder muscle in particular that we've only really mentioned in passing and definitely deserves a closer look and that of course is deltoid. Now deltoid has a lot of different functions depending on which parts are activated. If you activate the clavicular fibres at the front, it raises the arm, it flexes that shoulder joint, as we can see here in the model. If you activate the fibres to the side, so the fibres that attach from the acromion, then that raises the arm to the side. That's what we call abduction at the shoulder joint or abduction of the humerus. And then deltoid has a posterior portion as well, attaching from the spine of the scapula. And this, as you can see, will pull the arm backwards. So if you move your arm forwards in flexion, those posterior fibres are then going to return the arm, but also extend it behind the shoulder. You can see that from a different angle as well. So there you go, they pull the arm back. Let's look at a bit of a living anatomy then. Here's my deltoid muscle, this triangular muscle over the shoulder. 
and if I activate the, the front of it, those clavicular fibres, the arm flexes, the shoulder flexes, and my fingertips move out towards you. If I activate the lateral portion of it, the side portion of it attached to the acromion, then that is going to abduct the arm. That movement is initiated by supraspinatus, but then deltoid, which is a much bigger muscle, takes over. If I activate the muscles at the back here, so the, the fibres of deltoid which attach to the spine of the scapula, that's going to pull my arm backwards, that's going to extend the shoulder joint. Now look again at abduction of the arm and notice that it's not just the humerus that's moving, the scapula is rotating on the thorax as well. When you do this movement, bringing your arm up and above your shoulder, it's actually quite a complicated movement with lots and lots of muscles involved. Supraspinatus is responsible for initiating abduction, for just starting to move your arm out to the side. Once there's a good angle then for deltoids, that can take over and this is a much larger muscle, so that's now pulling. But in fact, what you can't see on the back of me is that my scapula is moving as well. So as I raise my arm, in fact, my scapula is also rotating on the back of my thorax. And that rotational movement of the scapula, which if you remember is just floating on the back of the rib cage, is carried out primarily by trapezius and by that muscle serratus anterior. So that was a fairly comprehensive tour of the muscles around the shoulder. But before I let you go, I want to show you one of my favorite tricks of complete anatomy. So we'll go back to the full body model and you can strip away all the muscles and then I want to home in on the skull and we'll strip away all the connective tissue, including those cartilaginous ears, and then do something rather interesting with the bones of the skull. Here we go. You can explode them and look at the individual skull bones. We'll look at all of them in detail another time. Thanks very much for watching, that was quite a long one. You've made it through to the end of the joints and the muscles of the pectoral girdle. Next time, we're going to be moving down the arm and looking at the muscles within your arm. We've already met one of them, biceps.